that has to do with some pretty adult topics such as nudity, addiction, pornography. So I, if you have any children, it's probably not a good idea to let them watch the video. Also, if you have any older kids, you probably want to watch the video yourself before you let them watch it and probably discuss the topics in the video with them. Anyway, I'm going to start off by giving a small introduction of myself. I am White Mountain Apache and Chippewa from the Boys Fort Band in Minnesota. And when I was a little girl, I grew up on the White Mountain Apache Reservation. My mom is full-blooded White Mountain Apache. She speaks Apache fluently and she grew up, uh, you know, in a time where her mother still wore traditional camp dresses and things like that way. When I was a little girl growing up on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona, my mom told me and my brother that she was told as a child that if you look at naked people, you could go blind. And so she told us, you know, never to look at naked people because you'll probably go blind. You, you will go blind. She didn't say probably. She said you will. Anyway, uh, she said that that's what she was told when she was a little kid. Now, obviously, after you get married that, you, you know, we understood that uh, married people are parents probably that doesn't apply to them. But, um, and you know, there are other times in your life when you see someone naked, you know, like if you're a doctor or, or if you, you have children and you have to bathe them and care for them. But that's not the type of nudity they were talking about, right? What they were talking about was specifically about sexual nudity, that you shouldn't peep on others when they're getting dressed and that you shouldn't look at dirty magazines. If you ever came across one, you should throw it away right away and don't look. Um, and, um, I remember, um, you know, talking about it with my cousins, cause obviously they heard the same thing from their, their parents, you know, and, uh, anyway, of course, none of us ever tested it out, but, um, you know, we understood the underlying principle, which was this, that you shouldn't look at naked people. Anyway, uh, so two years ago, I wrote a post on Facebook and it showed up just a couple of days ago in my Facebook memories um, thing that shows up on your homepage. Anyway, it said, I wrote, when are people going to realize that nobody wants to see them naked or close to naked or almost naked or almost completely uncovered or running around in their skivvies, which is underwear, as you know, or wearing something that looks like they are running around in their skivvies or anything like unto it. Sorry, that was a mosquito. Unless they are married to you. Probably never for a whole bunch of people because they do it every day and you got to put up with it to be polite even though it's awful to have to look at. People don't understand that it doesn't matter if you've got a nice body or not. It's still awful for the majority of the population to have to see all of it or close to all of it or even a whole bunch of all of it. Anyway, someone commented under it saying that if this comment was true, then why does pornography exist? And that leads me to my topic, which is don't look at naked people and don't run around naked. When most women say no one wants to see, it typically means a lot of normal people don't want to see, and that is almost universally understood. Sure, there are a lot of sick people out there that need help. A lot of people that watch porn are porn addicts and they need help. There are some people that are so evil that they will do it regardless of the knowledge that there is help available or the knowledge that it is wrong. And um, most people that start watching porn get a feeling telling them that it's wrong, but they don't really realize how bad it is. And a lot of people get sucked into pornography before they realize that it's addictive. Thankfully, now there are many outlets where people can get help for pornography addiction, which is a type of sexual addiction. There are many sexual addictions that are rampant in our world today because of the porn industry, which has been allowed to flourish in certain sectors and states in our society and around the world. Some include porn addiction, sex addiction, which manifests itself as often having sex with people who you barely know and prostitution and others. In addi addition, there are also relationship addicts who jump from one romance to another, always craving the excitement of a sexual experience with a new lover. 
the symptoms and the destruction caused to the people who are afflicted with porn or sex addiction are just as bad as any medical disease out there. I remember just six years ago when Obama was, was president, how you could do an internet search for anything and dirty pictures would show up on the page. By dirty, I mean naked people, many of them doing sexual things. The moral behavior of society often reflects what people think is permissive by the leadership in society, which is why I brought up the thing about it going on a lot, me seeing a lot more of it during uh, the time when Obama was the president. Now, Obama never said that he supported any of that kind of stuff, but um, at least not that I know of, but a lot of sexual behaviors that are outside the norms of society, like homosexual behavior, really took a strong hold in the laws of our country during Obama's presidency due to his open support of that type of lifestyle. As a result, many people who had alternate, alternate lifestyles, like those who support pornography and prostitution or participate in it, uh, felt safe in their ability to promote their lifestyle upon the rest of society. And those lifestyles, along with the businesses with them, along with the businesses associated with them, grew and flourished. A lot of people who have gotten addicted to porn and became sex addicts over the last century since it has been a matter of scientific medical study were roped into it when they were too young to know what was going on. From a lot of the stories that I read online, this happened to many people who accidentally came across porn magazines or accidentally came across it on the internet. Many who had it worst as teenagers and adults first came across it when they were around seven years old. These often are people who are involved in the most destructive forms of porn addiction by the time they have reached young adulthood. And I also uh, saw that, you know, a lot of people that have gotten themselves into um, worse types of behaviors that get them in trouble with the law really got involved in it when they were very little. Many people who have grown up in the world after the internet became a big thing had their first sexual experiences from accidentally coming across porn. It is very, very, very addictive and purposefully so. The porn companies don't leave anything to chance. They study the ways to gain first time users and study how to keep them addicted. There have been many studies done on pornography addiction and men are found to be more susceptible to becoming addicted to it than women. Though women are starting to be targeted with it more and more, and many are becoming addicted in larger numbers as well. Companies in the sex industry prey on the genetic makeup of men and try to get them addicted as soon as possible. They appear to prefer to get people addicted while they are children, if possible. I believe they are now targeting women that way as well. Many men are addicted before they ever have their first girlfriend, before they ever fall in love, and before they are ever even married. In short, their first sexual experiences are described by sex therapists as having been with a computer. This is very different than what most humans experience throughout existence on this earth. This happened to many men who became young teens around the year 2000 and later. Many of these people have shoulder, shouldered the full onslaught of what the internet, media, and marketing companies could throw at them before they were even adults. This was unforeseen and the knowledge of how to deal with it or defend oneself against it was not available. As such, many people have had their bodies and minds warped by an alternate reality created by conspiring and devious individuals. There have been also so many marriages and relationships that have been completely destroyed because of this evil. I have also read studies which detail how some norms our culture has as well have prepped and primed men and boys for addiction with the way women dress in public. Like I said, studies have been done on this very topic, many of them. Men are wired differently than women being constantly bombarded with sexual images, 
in the form of scantily dressed women on screen, on billboards, and in public changes their mental structure enough over time that when, men, when many men are first exposed to pornography, they are hooked already. This is one of the primary forms of introduction to pornography that men and boys are dealing with without even knowing how it is affecting them over time. Many people don't think that it is that big of a deal um, to go out wearing short shorts and low cut shirts or shirts that show their midriff. However, marketing advertisements and the type of dressing from people, this type of dressing from people where they're dressing, um, you know, really scandalous or in scanty clothing, um, whether they are working out, going for a run, or just heading out for a night with friends, preps and primes a man's brain. And I repeat, and I repeat, oftentimes this is where they start down the road to addiction. By the time they have seen their first dirty image, their brain is already ready to attach onto it, to latch onto it, and then to start down an even worse addictive spiral. Perhaps people reason that men wouldn't become addicted to things like porn if they didn't want to. They might say that it's the person's fault that is going through the addiction because they should have the willpower to know better and the sense to stop or they should have listened to what was taught to them in church or maybe they should have even cared that there was church to begin with and they should have been going. Um, people do have responsibilities for their own choices. They do have the responsibility to change. Parents have the responsibility to protect their kids. People have the responsibility to say no to buying or looking at porn before it ever becomes an addiction. People have the responsibility to dress in a manner that is not going to become the building blocks for addiction in another person. In addition, many people, as I said earlier, were innocent when they were fir first exposed to it. Porn companies make sure to target people as young as possible because the sooner they can get them addicted, the more customers they have. Whether a person is caught young or caught into the net of porn as an elderly person, which has been happening nowadays in much larger numbers. One thing is for certain, humans are being warred upon and not everyone is aware of what is happening to them until it is too late. We would hope that people know ahead of time that pornography is unbelievably addictive and that they know what it's going to do to them. I do believe that since not much has been spoken of about it, a good portion of our society doesn't know much about it, both men and women. I think that a lot of women that dress in skimpy clothes don't know the evil that they're enabling and causing. I do know that there are a lot of good Christian women out there that run around in short shorts and tank tops and low cut blouses at church activities of various churches even. And even at Sunday worship and no one thinks anything about it. Some might reason that we need to look at the heart of the person and not the body. We should focus on a person's heart because that is what is valuable. And we should welcome anyone, even if they haven't been taught about modesty yet. However, we do need to teach modesty and dress to the members of our churches for the safety and health of our society and upcoming generations. I do know that there are many people out there that just don't know. I do believe that if people are taught with love and kindness, that many people will happily make changes in their own behavior to benefit their fellow brothers and sisters in humanity. I want you to know that there are few things on this planet that can destroy a man so thoroughly and quickly than having a porn or sex addiction. I was told about a year ago, a year and a half ago, by a person that I was good friends with, that he had read that the number one way that people who have this type of addiction commit suicide is by blowing out their own brains with a gun. Why would someone do that? Um, well, here's a little bit about how having this type of addiction affects a person. When a person is in the full throes of a porn slash sex addiction, they often don't know what is happening to them. While they are in the act, um, 
you know, however the addiction manifests itself, whatever behaviors they are doing, they're often unable to stop until after it has happened. Their brain structure has changed enough that the fight or flight center of their brain, which also contains the pleasure center, hijacks the decision-making capabilities of the prefrontal cortex where logic and spirituality reside. I have read that um, and seen some videos that say that um, the prefrontal cortex is where we connect with God, where we pray, where we uh, make moral choices for ourselves. And um, basically anything that is spiritual, all of our decision making, the, the choices we make, the kind of person we want to be, that's where it resides. At that point, the central brain has taken over because porn addiction rewires the brain by creating a new neural pathway. As the person engages in whatever the sexual activity is that defines their addiction, they start down behavior that is no longer governed by the prefrontal cortex, decision-making part of their brain. At that point, I have read that the addicted person can't stop what is happening to their bodies until it is over. That is what defines an addiction. An addiction defined by psychologists usually is that a person can't stop even if they wanted to. They need help. By then, they know that they've destroyed their families, they've destroyed their lives. Often they have done things that they would not normally have ever wanted to do. Like I said before, um, some people are evil and they revel in it and they like it and they don't ever want to change. However, addiction by its, def by its definition is when someone couldn't stop if they wanted to. They have lost the ability to control their own bodies with regard to the addictive substance. He or she has once again failed to be the person that he or she always wanted to be. And there's only so many times that a person can go through this before it really wears them down physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. There are other horrible side effects. Their bodies physically go through withdrawals which are excruciating in duration and effect if they ever do try to quit. Even when they haven't quit, their body vacillates on a daily basis or longer with these um, um, cravings and then the withdrawals. They can last for months when a person tries to quit. For, from what I have read and heard, it is scary, debilitating, all-encompassing, and torturous. While they are involved in their addiction, relationships deteriorate, their sense of self-esteem drops dangerously low, they lose care for themselves and for their own lives. They're constantly in pain. They are constantly sick. They feel awful most of the time. They're in a fog and in a haze. Their attitudes become increasingly hostile towards themselves and towards women if they are men. With women, it's the same. Their attitudes also become increasingly hostile towards themselves and towards men. They hate themselves. They begin to lose faith that they can't be helped. They feel ashamed and so they don't want anyone to know. They feel like there is no way out and many would welcome death rather than continue to go through it or have their families know what they've become. This disease literally takes a healthy man and completely dismantles his brain and body piece by piece until he is nothing but a shell of himself. Women who are dealing with it, I've read, have it just as bad. Why do I bring all this up? I want to remind you at this point that I'm telling you this so you will be better formed when making cho informed when making choices. Our society needs to change for the better with regard to how we market our products, with regard to our own behaviors, and with regard to our social norms. Porn addiction usually leads to other types of addictions and behaviors as well that are within the sexual addiction realm such as being promiscuous or people putting themselves in situations where they would meet up with people online for sexual activities in person. These types of things can cause uh, you know, people to get diseases and also, as you know, to, to give them to other people that are less suspecting. We hope that people who are afflicted with this disease and their family members as well know that there is help. There is hope. There are people that have overcome it. There are families that have survived it. 
Many of those survivors, both family and addict, now help other people to become healthy and whole again. I in no way suggest that people should not be accountable for things they have done to harm other people, especially the innocent. We do have laws to protect our children from predators for good reason. The fact that one is addicted does not give that person the right to break the laws of the land. If you have a problem, it is best to get help for it before you ever get yourself into a situation where you are justly forced to pay for your crimes against individuals and society. I heard a talk by Dallin H. Oaks. A talk is, is like a speech that you give in church. Anyway, when I was single before I married my late husband, Ammon, Dallin Oaks is one of the leaders of my church. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The things I have said here are, by the way, not endorsed by the church. These are my own thoughts based on what I have learned. Incidentally, our church does have an addiction recovery program. Many churches do. In the program we have at church, you can participate in person or through a phone call anonymously. And they have manuals online for help and study. In addition, the facilitators of the ARP or addiction recovery program are usually people who know what it is and how to recover. And some may have gone through it themselves. Anyway, Dallin H. Oaks was saying to men in that talk not to become involved in watching pornography. He also cautioned the women not to become it. By that, I didn't take it to mean that he thought that all of the women in attendance were in danger of running off to a pornography business and start and um, starting to become, you know, porn models or actresses. The women I've met at church are not anything like that. I, I took it to mean that he was telling us not to dress immodestly since that is a lesser, more introductory form of pornography, in my opinion. I know that there will always be people who say that whatever you are wearing is improper. I remember seeing movies where people a long time ago in some cultures could not even show their ankles because it was improper. However, just because there will always be people who are extreme in their standards of dress in the opposite direction does not mean that we shouldn't change our way of doing things if what we are doing stands the chance of hurting other people. In the word of wisdom, which are dietary recommendations, which many of us choose to follow in my church, which help us to stay healthy, it says that this law is good for the weakest of saints. The word of wisdom was, and I quote, given for a principle with a promise, adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints who are or can be called saints. Do we care for the weakest of all saints? Who might be those who are more predisposed to sexual addiction, whether from genetic or environmental or sociological factors? Or do we put a stumbling block in their way and then say that they should have more willpower when they are destroyed by our, by our collective behaviors as a society? Furthermore, I know it seems like the girls who dress in scandalous, skimpy clothing are getting so much more attention. It's a big problem when you are single and trying to find someone to marry. I, it hurts, especially when you have lost the affection and attention of someone you really like to a girl who was dressed that way or who dressed that way fairly often. We have to trust God first. He will provide. Our covenant and commitment is with him and no one else. He, we do his will and he provides for us what we need, including a companion who we are attracted to and who is worthy of our love and time. So we don't need to dress that way to get what we want. When a man falls in love with you, he will fall in love with how he feels when he is around you. That is completely separate from the types of things that typically can sexually stimulate a man's eyes. So please remember that you don't have to lower your standards. When I was young, I didn't know any better, and I used to dress in skimpy clothing from time to time. In my culture, on my reservation, women mostly kept themselves covered up wearing normal clothes, but not revealing clothes. But there are always opportunities for the macro culture to creep in and people start conforming to the norms of the prevalent um, society in the country. I'm not pointing fingers here or there. It just happens. Now, I don't want you to think that I, I dress 
in a really scandalous way. I just want you to know that sometimes for a short period, I wore short shorts and even though they didn't look good on me, in my opinion, I wore them sometimes. And it didn't really last that long because I didn't like the way I looked in them and was always self-conscious about it. I also wore a midriff shirt a few times. I wore a scandalous Halloween costume at least twice. It wasn't all the time, but it was sometimes. I never felt like I looked good in tank tops, but I wore them once in a while. In 1998 was when I became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was taught by the missionaries at that time and I learned about the law of chastity according to what the church teaches, which is abstaining from adultery and fornication. I also learned the I also learned about dressing modestly after I joined the church. I understood the importance of dressing modestly for my own self-respect and to give glory to God because my body is a temple. I've worn modest clothing since 1999 or 2000. My shorts don't come any higher than the tops of my knees. I don't wear tank tops. I don't wear low cut shirts. So, it's, so there is never an issue of anyone seeing cleavage. I don't expose my midriff and when I go swimming, I wear a one piece swimsuit if one is required. Otherwise, I usually wear short shorts and a tank top. So that's the only time you will see me wearing short shorts or a tank top is when I'm swimming. Okay, I hope it doesn't seem like I'm trying to brag or make myself out to be so good. I'm just trying to pass along information that you may have not been introduced to. Incidentally, I've seen many women including sometimes those in my church who change into very immodest clothing to go swimming, to play sports, and to do physical activities such as running out in public. What you wear in the privacy of your home is your own business in my opinion, but I don't think it's necessary for people to get as naked as possible to do sports. Uh, I've done sports my whole life and I, you know, I, I don't see that people really need to to the extent that we have in our society. I have seen men do many of the same activities and excel at them as well without having to get almost completely naked. I do understand that many, support, many sports might require special clothing for safety because of the highly technical aspect of that particular sport. However, many of the outfits worn during sports unnecessarily don't leave much or anything to the imagination. Modesty in dress is put forth for the effect of not inciting lust in other people. Of course, some people have problems and will be lustful regardless. However, it is not okay for us to force a sexual response in other people who would normally not have one just because we are running around naked or mostly naked or almost completely naked or, or partially almost naked, however you want to say it. Um, then I've noticed that culture expects men and women not to react to that type of show. If you are exercising out in public, outside the solitude of your own home, then it does not matter if it's exercise that makes you naked or if it's just you deciding to wear an outfit that shows a lot to go to the store or to the library, for example. Either way, you are still naked. And naked means that your body is showing and people will have to be forced to look at you or look around you or look past you or whatever they've got to do just to get where they are going because they're going to have to go near you or around you. In short, exercise is not an excuse. Most people are not running in the Olympics or performing some highly technical maneuver as part of their sport and they never will. Wearing a tiny pair of shorts and sports bra in public, for example, is not going to make you run any faster than what you are already running. At least not enough to justify you putting on what most people would consider a show for everyone to see. Though, like I said before, they will be too polite to ever mention it to you. Please don't think that I'm trying to body shame you or make you feel awful. I don't believe in being judgmental. I do believe that if you care enough about others that that you will kindly in a spirit of love impart knowledge and wisdom to them that you have gained yourself. Please don't lie to yourself. If you are scantily clothed and exercising, it does not mean that you are more covered than if you are not exercising. Your body is exposed either way. 
The reason I say this is because there seems to be a disconnect in some people's reasoning where they think that for some reason, if they are exercising, then their tiny short shorts are fine and no longer considered short because they were running or playing volleyball. However, if they were not exercising and that same person wore a super short pair of shorts that's the same length as their running shorts, this same person would feel like they were completely exposed and being immodest, dressing immodestly. I bring this up because I have seen women in my own church do this, though it is not always the case. I have heard women discussing it in Relief Society on occasion um, some women will argue their right to wear skimpy clothing in public and for some reason it's only okay to do this when they are exercising. Please be honest with yourself. Please be considerate of others. Once again, please understand that what I am saying is not considered official church doctrine at my church. I also want you to remember that I'm not trying to make you feel bad and I hope that that is not the case. I wanted to reiterate that before I bring up another touchy subject. Other women will not appreciate you having broadcast your wares out to their boyfriends, husbands, children, and any other man in their life that they care about. I'm sorry to say it that way, but that's how people see it when they have it right in front of them. We live in a society that is polite enough that people don't want to cause disruption by letting you know that your dress is causing them discomfort. I have seen and heard of men who look away in embarrassment and sometimes discomfort at someone wearing clothing that is revealing. Sometimes these men are scoffed at and treated like they are not men if they don't like looking at it. There is a reason people only get married to one person at a time. It's because they only want to be intimately acquainted with and sexually intimate with only one person and not everyone who is walking down the street or running down the street. Please be respectful of other people's bodies and seek not to elicit a forced sexual response from other people that is not asked for and not invited. Humans are built to react to visual stimulus. Unfortunately, our bodies seem to notice large portions of exposed skin. It's out of the norm and when you're in public and you see that much exposed skin, often people will just look that way without even realizing. And it's part of the reason is it's just not that normal to see. Um, in many studies that talk about porn addiction, the studies, uh, the people who did the studies say that men are genetically built to be turned on by visual stimuli. So immodesty can, in a manner of speaking, force a sexual response in people. Modesty is when we choose not to do that. I have heard women say to other women who protest this behavior that you are just jealous because you don't have a good body. Or they will say it behind their back with other women. And those other women will often agree. And that continues the cycle. We shouldn't do that. Being modest in dress is about your commitment to God, to put him first, and your commitment to treat your fellow man and woman with respect and courtesy and dignity, I might add. I always have been told since I was grown up that I have a nice body, and probably a lot of it goes to the fact that I've been doing exercise a lot and I've been working out for the most part throughout my teenage years and childhood. And I'm sure some of it's just genetic. On occasion, I have been told by well-meaning individuals who don't yet understand that I should show off my body more. And I've tried to politely explain to them that that is not what I choose. I don't yell at them and tell them off and stuff like that when they're trying to give you a compliment. But it's not what I chose. I will politely say that there is no one that needs to know what is under my clothing except for my husband. And that is after I marry him, not before. <laughs> anyway, now there is nothing wrong with being shaped the way that many humans would like to be shaped. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying to think that the human body is something that we should be ashamed of. Sexuality is not something to be ashamed of. We don't need to cover ourselves with tents and take it to the extreme. 
we do need to exercise modesty and caution. I remember once or twice wearing semi-short shorts to go work out at the gym, lifting weights when I was in my mid-twenties, even after I became a member of my church and had been taught about modesty. However, that was only once or twice while I was learning what was needful and what was not. I was still young and still learning how to apply gospel principles to my life. I say this not to excuse myself and my lack of knowledge at the time, but I say it because I don't want you to be judgmental of each other. I know that being judgmental can cause bitterness and anger in your heart when you see other people doing things that you know aren't right, that you yourself aren't doing, and that you think that they should be doing or not doing. The most you can do for people is to give them knowledge and then let it go. You can pray for them as well, but I mean to say that you can't change them. You can't control them. Controlling others is explicitly against the gift of agency, which is the gift of choice for all God's sons and daughters. And the desire to control or change is where the anger which manifests itself and judgmental feelings come from. If you impart knowledge, then let it go. You free yourself from the expectation that people need to listen to what you have to say. Not all people will listen or see the good in what you have to say. You trust them to make their own choice and continue to love them regardless. Thankfully, there are many people in this world that gravitate towards light. They search for it, they value it, they take bits of it over time. They take what they can handle and over time their behavior changes as they choose to do whatever God is telling them is right. Not what you choose to tell them, but what the Holy Spirit confirms to them and their conscience as truth. I want you to know that God is real. I want you to know that he can help you. I want you to know that dressing modestly encourages the Holy Spirit to be able to teach you because you are more humble and more willing to follow God's will. For those of you who are stuck in addiction or are working in the porn industry, whether as someone who runs a company or someone who has been a model or actress in that industry, I want you to know that you can get out of it. Pray to God for help. Even if all you can do is pray in your mind, please don't lose hope. I know that many people have been forced to work in the sex industry and would not ever have done so if they hadn't been forced to. I want you to know that your family loves you that the rest of society loves you, that those of us who are good people, that if those of us who are good people knew where you are and knew who you are, that we would help you. So don't give up hope for yourself. For those of you who are addicted to sex or porn, or even are just relationship addicts who jump from one relationship to another with no end in sight, I want you to know that you can get help. You can change behaviors if it's just a behavior, and if it's an addiction, you can overcome it. Learn as much as you can about it, if necessary. There have been many people who have recovered from this sickness. The brain can change back to the way it was when it was healthy, and if you feel for some reason like your brain was never healthy or hardly ever healthy throughout your life, the brain is malleable, and that means it can change to a healthy state of being. Perhaps you are scared that no psychologist could understand what you are going through, and you will not get the help you need. There are CSATs, which are certified sex addiction therapists, who are specially trained to help you and understand you no matter what your problem is or how bad it is. You can fix things. You can make amends. The people you've hurt, believe it or not, have the capacity to heal through the atonement of Jesus Christ. But just because they have the capacity to heal doesn't mean that it's okay to keep hurting them. Also, don't believe that what you have done is so bad that you can't be forgiven in this life or the next. Because you can be forgiven by those people that you know and by God in heaven. So don't give up hope. Find yourself some help even if you have to pay for it. But there are many churches out there and other groups willing to give competent help without charging a thing. The main thing is that the way will be open for you as you start down that path. 
Perhaps you've tried many ways to get out of that lifestyle and someone always stops you or something always stops you. I watched a video the other day about a woman who kept trying to get away from a bad life. She came to Jesus and wept on his feet and showered his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair. Jesus said to the man who was being judgmental of that lady that she had done the, those things for him, but the guy who was being judgmental whose house they were at hadn't given Jesus water to wash his feet or a rag to dry them with. Jesus also said that because she had much love in her heart that she was forgiven. It reminded me of what happens to some people today. You try to change, your life comes falling down around you again, but I don't want you to lose hope. Keep trying. Like I said, if you head down the path towards God, towards getting help, you will keep finding more and more help and more answers. Yes, the forces of Satan exist on this earth in the form of spirits and in the form of conspiring people who want to do evil. However, the forces of God also exist on this earth and they also exist in spirit. They exist in the form of good people who are still alive and willing to help you and set a good example for you. And the forces of God are stronger than the forces of Satan. All you need to do is to pick a side and keep going towards that side, no matter how many mistakes you make or how many times you fail. As soon as you get your footing underneath you again, head in that direction towards God again, I promise you that you will get stronger and the cords that bind you in addiction will get weaker and weaker and eventually they will break and fall off. I know this is a lot of information some things you may have not heard before are considered, and I hope you find something that helps. And also, please don't think that I'm ever going to be judging you if I ever see you in public. I don't, I'm not a judgmental person, and I don't, I don't prefer to be a judgmental person. I don't like to be. Um, you know, and I don't expect that I'm going to go outside after I post this video and all of a sudden everyone's going to be running around in modest clothing. <laughs> uh, um... But um, I made this video for the purpose of perhaps helping out some people out there that, um, you know, are just looking for information. And I hope that you found something in this, in this video that was helpful to you. And thanks so much for watching. Bye.